preeclampsia is very, very dangerous, and I am one of the lucky ones. An innovative program addresses the racial inequality in maternal health. As people, we all just want to be understood and have a sense of belonging. The bond these two share that's helped them form an unlikely friendship. And the CDC rolls out a new ad campaign urging people to quit smoking. Welcome to Eye on Health, where we focus on stories that affect your physical and mental well-being. I'm Michael George. We begin with a warning from pharmacists around the U.S. about a shortage of medications. According to the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, there are more than 300 drugs currently in short supply. That includes chemotherapy drugs and those needed for ADHD, like Adderall. So big picture, this is a market failure. CBS News medical contributor Dr. Celine Gounder says the most concerning shortage has to do with sterile injectable drugs. Those need to be made under specific conditions. And the recent weight loss drug craze has made it worse. So there are a few things that drive this. One, the cost of building the manufacturing uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. so that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars. You, on top of that, have more demand for sterile injectable drugs like Ozempic, Wigovi, Manjaro. So those companies, Novo and Lilly, they're buying up what little sterile injectable supply we have. So that's probably going to make these things worse. Two other issues, according to Dr. Gounder, drug companies are not incentivized to make cheaper generic drugs because the profit margins aren't there. And many raw materials come from China and India, two markets the U.S. has very little control or influence over. Since late last year, the CDC received more than 500 reports of potential cases of lead poisoning from cinnamon applesauce pouches. The FDA's leading hypothesis is that the contamination was the result of economically motivated adulteration, also known as food fraud. Three brands, all made in Ecuador, were affected. Now the FDA says it's shifting its focus to a post-incidence response, considering additional surveillance and compliance activity. There's another alert from the federal health agencies, this one for counterfeit Botox. The FDA says it's caused an outbreak of botulism-like illness. More than a dozen people have gotten sick across several states, a majority requiring hospitalization. All the affected people reported receiving injections from unlicensed or untrained individuals or in non-health care settings, including homes and spas. Dermatologists recommend double-checking what you put in your body. But in Miami, lots of people price shop um, and would find these little places where counterfeit Botox was being used. Um, I think one of the most important things is, is to make sure that you're getting it from a reputable source and to check the box. Actually ask your practitioner to show you the box that it was drawn up from. The FDA is working with Botox maker AbbVie to investigate and remove the counterfeit products from within the U.S. Symptoms include blurry vision, drooping eyelids, difficulty swallowing, and fatigue. The Department of Homeland Security announced a major push to shed light on a dark threat to teenagers on social media. Officials are seeing an alarming rise in cases of what's known as sex torsion, and it's taking a devastating toll on some teens. Here's Jolyn Kent. This campaign is the first of its kind. Predators go where the kids are. The Department of Homeland Security is launching No to Protect to raise awareness of rampant child sexual exploitation online. Our mission is to eradicate this scourge. DHS, along with Snapchat, Google, Meta, and others, want to educate families and kids about how to detect suspicious behavior, seek help, and report incidents to law enforcement. Are you satisfied with what the big tech companies are doing and how they are cooperating with the federal government? Joe Ling, when I reached out to the tech company um, chief executives, uh, we were met with prompt and affirmative responses eagerly joining this campaign. The tech companies need to do more. The campaign comes after Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg apologized to parents on Capitol Hill. Snapchat CEO Evan Spiegel did the same. I'm so sorry that we have not been able to prevent these tragedies. It is the responsibility of tech companies, probably first and foremost, because we are providing the technology, but young people themselves have a role to play in their own safety. So do their parents. Tammy Rodriguez's 11-year-old daughter, Selena, died by suicide in 2021 after sexual predators pursued her online. When you see a campaign like this, how does it make you feel? I'm happy to see it, but they need to know that the help is there, that they don't have to end their lives. 
DHS says the threat to kids online has never been bigger. In fact, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children received more than 36 million reports of suspected child sexual exploitation last year. That's an increase of 12% compared to 2022. Jolene Kent, CBS News, Los Angeles. The Memorial Hermann Texas Medical Center abruptly halted its liver and kidney transplant programs this month. According to the New York Times, officials are investigating allegations that Dr. Steve Bynan secretly manipulated a government database to make some of his own patients ineligible to receive new livers. If you look at the data, you can see that a disproportionate number of patients at Memorial Hermann have died while waiting for liver transplants. New York Times reporter Brian Rosenthal says the investigation is looking into how many patients were affected by the alleged actions. There's my daughter, that's my Bridget nephew. Mendez has been waiting six years for a kidney from Memorial Hermann. Uh, I got a message. Somebody sent it to me telling me to, hey, read this article. And no one's called me from Memorial Hermann, but seeing that article, it kind of crushed me. Mendez has no idea what's next for her. Is it going to take another year for them to investigate it? Or is it going to take another two years or six months? We don't know. So now it's just like, um, I don't know what to do now. It's Memorial Hermann released a statement saying they're working with the University of Texas to help patients get the care they need. Now for some good transplant news. A trial in the UK is hoping to catch organ rejection more quickly. 152 participants who have a lung transplant will also receive a skin graft patch from their donor. If a rash forms, it could be an early sign of rejection. We really desperately need better ways to reduce the risk of acute rejection after lung transplant and also to diagnose it more reliably without the need for these complex and invasive tests. Doctors can take a tiny biopsy to confirm the rejection and treat the problem with medication before it gets worse. Black women are three times more likely than white women to die during childbirth. One hospital in New York has launched an innovative program to address that disparity. Bradley Blackburn spoke with a mom who says it helped save her life. Anika Walker's baby Nico is almost two years old. He's a ball of energy. <laughs> but bringing him into the world came with dangers for her health and his. In her third trimester, she was diagnosed with preeclampsia, high blood pressure, and needed an emergency C-section. Preeclampsia is very, very dangerous, and I am one of the lucky ones. She understood the risk and got the vital care because she participated in a program at Northwell Health called MOMS, short for Maternal Outcomes and Morbidity, the goal to educate and support women during and after pregnancy, especially women of color. I'm getting emotional because they really helped me. I was very scared. They basically held my hand through the whole process. Maternal mortality overall is very high in this country. For black women, it's even higher. Dr. Donette Lewis says a full system of care is life-saving. Their postpartum program with home visits and an AI chatbot to keep in contact with patients has cut hospital readmissions by nearly 60% for black patients. If we can make a change in that across the country, that we can uh, decrease uh, some of those disparities. So I think it's crucial that programs like this exist. You felt like you had an advocate here. Absolutely. Walker is still getting support through moms, and she has a message to others who are expecting. We deserve everything that anyone else is receiving healthcare wise. Having knowledge about pregnancy, about your body, is the most important tool. Knowledge that empowers moms to demand vital care so they can care for new lives. Bradley Blackburn, CBS News, New York. The oldest living conjoined twins have died. Lori and George Chappelle were 62 years old. An obituary by a Pennsylvania funeral home says they died on April 7th at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. The cause of death was not listed, but their long lives defied medical expectation. The twins were joined at the head but had separate brains. Coming up, the new vacation trend inspired by the oldest among us. And how to tell the difference between COVID-19 and spring allergies. Welcome back. 
For the first time since 2001, a majority of Americans, 57% to be exact, said they need more sleep. This is according to new polling data from Gallup. It's a complete reversal from 2013, the last time Gallup calculated this data. Back then, 56% of Americans believed they got enough sleep, while only 43% felt they needed more to feel better. Women under 50 are the group that's least likely to get enough rest. One place to catch up on sleep, vacation. Most vacationers are looking for rest and relaxation when they book their trips. But there's a new trend gaining popularity, the so-called longevity vacations. The Wall Street Journal says Americans are pursuing vacations that also prioritize personal health and include activities like vitamin IV drips and red light therapies. There are a lot more medical offerings now that purport to extend your lifespan. We're talking about stem cell therapy, you know, IV drips, as you mentioned, bone density scans, cancer testing. Reporter Alex Janin says this trend exploded in popularity during the COVID pandemic. People became very aware of their personal health, their mortality, and also, you know, people feel like in some cases traditional medicine doctors aren't listening to them, aren't catering to their needs, and they're exploring this sort of personalized medicine world. Janin says some of these have been inspired by centenarians, people who live to be more than 100 years old. The CDC is launching a new campaign aiming to get more people to quit smoking. The ads feature former smokers who want others to know how dangerous cigarettes can be. Bradley Blackburn has more. I thought I was doing everything right. Tammy ate healthy and ran every day. The 20-year smoker told herself menthol cigarettes weren't as harmful as others. When surgeons open your chest at age 44 because of heart disease from smoking, you learn quickly there is no healthy cigarette. It was at that point that I realized I needed to choose life over cigarettes. I fought my way back, and I'm here. And I wanted to reach out and tell people the story so that they don't get to the point where I was. Tammy is among the new faces of the CDC's Tips from Former Smokers campaign. This Today year's focus is on the dangers of menthol cigarettes, which the agency says can make it easier to start smoking and harder to stop. One of the goals of the campaign that we have is to motivate people to quit smoking as early in life as possible. Your body can undo some of the damage that smoking has caused. Your blood pressure can improve. Your risk for a heart attack improves. More than one million adults have quit thanks to the campaign, but about 28 million people in the U.S are still smoking. One of the things that I would recommend is, you know, talking to your doctor. Your health care provider could provide you with a quitting plan, recommend nicotine replacement therapy. I am so grateful to be alive. It's been eight years since Tammy kicked the habit. Reach out for help and don't quit quitting because you do not want to go what I went through. You want your life. You want to be here. So learn from my mistakes. She hopes everyone gets the message and the resources that are available. Bradley Blackburn, CBS News, New York. For several years, coughing became synonymous with COVID-19, but it could just be springtime allergies. Hunter Soward spoke with a pediatric infectious disease specialist about how COVID has impacted our health patterns. It's very difficult to differentiate infections from allergies. Whether it's a runny nose or bad cough, it's that time of year when you might be asking, am I sick or is this just an allergy flare up? We're really at a kind of transitional period in terms of illnesses. I mean, winter's over and summer's coming. Dr. Dean Blumberg with UC Davis Health says certain symptoms are critical red flags that it's time to see a doctor. With most allergies, there's no fever associated with that. So a fever would be a signal that it's likely due to an infection. In addition to fever, muscle pain, fatigue, and stomach issues like nausea are all key indicators it's not allergies. Experts say there is a surprising reason we're seeing our typical winter viruses in the spring and summer contributing to confusion. We've been through some very unusual years related to infectious diseases because of COVID and the associated lockdowns and masking and all. Effects from COVID-19 still felt today. So when could we finally see our six seasons return to normal? I'm hoping that now we're going to get back to the usual patterns of transmission where in the summer we just see the summer viruses and we don't see things like influenza and RSV. In a recent meeting of international regulatory authorities, an FDA official said they hope to have updated vaccines available by the end of the summer. 
Hunter Sowards, CBS News, Sacramento. Recent studies have shown mental health problems increased substantially since the COVID pandemic. According to the CDC, ADHD, anxiety problems, behavior problems, and depression are the most commonly diagnosed mental disorders in children. We spoke with Dr. Amy Daly. She's the president and CEO of Children's Miracle Network Hospitals to learn more about what's being done to address this critical issue. What have you learned as you've been monitoring this and on the front lines of this? What have you learned about the children's mental health crisis? Well, so I've had the opportunity. I started in this role on November 1st as, as the president and CEO for CMN Hospitals. And I've been going all around the country and visiting our hospitals and healthcare is really local. What we're seeing is that the needs are very specific. So when you look at your community compared to uh, different communities across the country, there's differences, whether it be geographic differences that may make up a difference of how far it is someone is to get to a hospital. It could be just the demographics, things like socioeconomic factors or access to education or food insecurity. All of these are things that impact the type of health care that kids need. What more should we all be doing to pay attention to children's mental health from parents to caregivers and even teachers? What, what can we all be doing to help? Well, I think you used the magic words, and that is pay attention, right? And that's what we would say if you talk to any of our healthcare providers, I'll say the number one thing for parents to do is just to be able to pay attention, look for changes, and then be willing to reach out and get support. We need to be able to decrease the stigma about just helping kids know that it's okay to not be okay. So they need to be able to turn to their friends, to their parents, to family members, to teachers, and there is help out there for you. Um, as I mentioned, clinical services are available, whether that's mental health, behavioral health, psychiatry, psychology, it's there. We just want the kids and the parents to know, go to your local member children's hospital and seek the help that you may need. It seems like we are seeing more emergency room visits uh, involving children and mental health during the pandemic and even post pandemic, what have you been seeing with regards to that? 100% of our hospitals, and we have 170 of them across North America, uh, they offer mental health services, resources, and community support for kids and teens. And nearly three quarters of our hospitals, they provide that in a telehealth format so that the kids can access it on their phone because we know that that's a way that they're used to getting information and something they're comfortable with. And so we have seen, as, as we all know, that post-pandemic, things like depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, or general behavior changes have really become kind of a second pandemic for us when you look at children and teenagers. And so we are so proud that we're raising money that the hospitals can then turn around and reinvest in those programs in their communities. Well, it's an important conversation and we'll, we'll continue to have it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, I appreciate it. After the break, why these micro robots are made with seaweed and gold. And people with autism are learning new skills as they work at this hospital. Welcome back. German scientists have created a micro robot they hope will unlock new treatments for cancer patients. The tiny robots, half the width of a human hair, have gold nanoparticles inside that can be controlled by lasers. Our micro robots are uh, made out of actually seaweed. We have um, nanomaterials in there that allow us to bring functionality so that we can also wirelessly control these micro robots. But um, in essence, they're the same size as the cells, they're soft as the cells, and we use them to uh, communicate with the cells. Researchers can produce millions of these micro-robots in minutes. We're, we're using these micro-robots to build um, tissues under synthetic conditions. And the whole point of this is to, in the future, then repair um, damaged tissue or organs 
um, at a really patient basis. The technology doesn't directly offer a way to help cancer patients, but they hope it leads to new therapeutics. April is Autism Acceptance Month. An innovative program at a New Jersey hospital is helping people with autism find jobs. Stephanie Stahl has more. Hi, ma'am. Eric Carlson is a greeter at Jefferson Cherry Hill Hospital. It's changed my whole life, which I'm grateful for. How? Um, it's just made me very happy. I love working oh, with visitor. people. Ms. Zing, I'll bring you to the desk. Eric is a graduate of Project Search, a program of the Yale School that does job training and placement for people with disabilities. Fourth floor, first office. Eric went through a 10-month training program designed for students with autism and related disorders. And they're in different departments. They're all in separate departments, yes, working independently. Ernie Lux is an instructor for Project Search. A lot of people think that just because somebody has a disability, it, they, everybody looks at what they can't do where we turn it around and we look at what they're good at and what they can do, and then we build on that. Jefferson usually has about six project interns and has hired 40% of them for jobs at the hospital. And as they gain different skills, they have more autonomy um, in different roles, but they always are assigned an employee to work with. We have so much stuff back here. Owen Marple is a current intern working in the pharmacy. You know project is, Search huh? is about yep. giving, giving people on the spectrum a chance to work in a real-world environment and in my case especially it's helping helping with social skills because I'm not exactly the most social person. Owen who's 21 is grateful for the opportunity and wants people to know this about being on the autism spectrum. It doesn't make me too too different from everyone else. It's not cooties for one. Right. <laughs> like I'm, I'm I may be a little bit different, but that's what makes me me. And we're all different in our own special way. Stephanie Stahl, CBS News. April is also a month when advocates are spotlighting people who have lost limbs or have limbs that are shaped differently. Danya Backus introduces us to a special program that teaches children and teens that their limb differences are what makes them extraordinary. What's your favorite subject? I like math. 19-year-old Ethan and 7-year-old Ramon have a special bond. Despite the age gap, the two share what makes them unique. He's like fun to me. He's very nice to me and kind. He's definitely very ambitious. I think a lot more ambitious than I was at that age. They both were born with left-hand limb difference. They met through a program called CATCH, which stands for Center for the Achievement of Teens and Children with Hands Differences. One of the challenges of having a limb difference is being stared at, being pointed at, uh, people being afraid that you're in pain or uh, maybe pointing at you or not including you in the game. Dr. Nina Lightdale Murick is the director of pediatric hand surgery at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. She created Catch as a way to extend care and support past surgery. And the best way to care for them is to introduce them to other people. It introduced me to a community of other kids like me and it was great because it gives a sense of belonging, right? I feel like as people we all just want to be understood and have a sense of belonging. Five of every 10,000 newborns in the U.S. have some difference in the arm, hand, forearm, or fingers. The sense of community and empowerment Catch provides reaches beyond the patients. I realize not to put limitations on him. Whatever fears and things that I have as a mom, don't put that on him. Let's just, just let them be themselves. Whether playing the ukulele, piano, or basketball. It's hard to, but you'll get there. Through their bond, Ethan and Ramon are reminded that their ordinary is extraordinary. Donya Backus, CBS News, Los Angeles. That's this week's Eye on Health. I'm Michael George. Thanks for joining us and be well.